Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Reconfirming the Group A Strep Diagnostic Algorithm with Molecular Confirmation. My name is Candace, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speaker. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on nexttalks.com. Live audience members can apply to receive a professional acknowledgement for continuing education or PACE credit issued by the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science through our exit survey at the end of today's session. Certificates for approved applications will be emailed by March 29th. At this point, I'd like to thank Luminex, who developed the contents for this presentation. Luminex has a mission to empower labs to obtain reliable, timely, and actionable answers, ultimately advancing health. They serve the needs of their customers in diverse markets, including clinical diagnostics, drug discovery, life science research, immunology, and personalized medicine. Their goal is to transform global healthcare with innovative instruments and assays that deliver cost-effective results to clinicians and researchers. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's event. Dr. Paul Lepart earned his PhD in microbiology, immunology, and molecular pathobiology from the University of Minnesota followed by a fellowship at the Department of Microbiology in the Kumamoto Laboratory at Tufts University, and a second fellowship in clinical microbiology at the University of Rochester Medical Center and School of Medicine. He earned various appointments at the Detroit Medical Center and is currently the Associate Director of Clinical Microbiology Laboratory and Assistant Professor of Pathology at Michigan Medicine at the University of Michigan. He also holds many seats on various committees and editorial review boards and has authored or co-authored more than 60 peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Leppard's clinical interests include bacteriology, virology, antimicrobial stewardship, and infection prevention. He strives to keep the microbiology lab on the cutting edge of diagnostic technology with the goal of helping deliver the best in patient care. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over the mic and the presentation over to Dr. Lepart, who may begin when he's ready. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you're able to see the presentation here. And thank you, Candice, for that kind introduction. And thank you to Luminex uh, for the opportunity to give this talk today on reconfirming the group A strep, uh, streptococcus pharyngitis diagnostic algorithm uh, with relevant right and rapid molecular confirmation. So we'll start off today with uh, obligatory uh, conflict of interest slide. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare regarding any assay instrument or vendor mentioned in this presentation. And then to further start off, uh, we'd love to uh, put a question to you, the audience, as far as what your role is in healthcare, and just to get an idea of who we're speaking with today. Uh, so I think uh, this is at the point where Candice will take this over and uh, the question will be presented to you, the audience. Thank you, Dr. Leppard here. As he mentioned, audience members, I will be launching a poll now. And the poll question reads, what is your role in the laboratory? Audience members, you can select from the following options, director, manager, supervisor, medical technologist, or other. Once again, that poll question is, what is your role in the laboratory? And it looks like a majority of our audience members have voted. I'm going to close our poll here and share the results with you. 
it looks like 24% voted for a director, 22% voted for a supervisor, 22% voted for other, 20% voted for a medical technologist, and 12% voted for manager. Back to you, Dr. Leppart. All right, thank you, Candace. That's a great mix uh, of people here for the talk, and I thank you again for your attendance. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll all uh, be better off at the end after question and answer and after this presentation. So moving on, uh, I want to introduce you to a little uh, topic uh, here that uh, I was introduced to myself many years ago at a clinical virology symposium down in Daytona, and that's the three R's, that, at the time it was the three R's of virology, uh, but I've kind of adapted it to, to be the three R's of microbiology to myself. And really they, they are relevant, rapid, and uh, right. And the way it was presented back then was uh, how this individual, and I, if I could remember who it was, and if you're listening today, please reach out to me, I'd love to give you credit. Uh, but I've used this in those previous year, in those subsequent years, to really guide evaluation of, uh, of any platform or assay that we were bringing in to the lab that I was involved with. And what it, the goal is to try and optimize those three components in any platform or any system. And just to give you some examples here, uh, influenza rapid antigen diagnostic testing, we're all very familiar with that. And it's certainly relevant it's certainly a rapid test, but the rightness or the accuracy of that assay has been shown to be an issue uh, and it's being dealt with. On the other end of that spectrum is respiratory PCR testing, respiratory panel PCR testing, which has come about uh, and quite uh, widespread now. Uh, it's certainly quite rapid, results within an hour. Uh, it's undoubtedly right. They're uh, very high reported sensitivity and specificity performance data, but its relevance in the outpatient and ED settings is questionable. And you name the classic microbiology test. Basically, it has years of established relevance and uh, oftentimes is the gold standard and held to be right. Uh, but that time to result, that long time to result that sometimes can be days or back in the virology, uh, classic virology uh, years, uh, can take weeks sometimes to result, really hampering utility in efficient patient care. So I've always taken these three R's in context to try and uh, achieve the ideal test, being that best blend of relevance, right, and rapid that one can achieve in any system. So I'm gonna start off today talking to you about the relevance of group A strep pharyngitis diagnostics. And first off, speaking to strep pyogeny superficial disease, uh, the clinical symptoms and epidemiology of major group A strep infections generally can be described as pharyngitis, uh, which has a huge global incidence, impetigo, which is still quite prevalent worldwide, uh, and scarlet fever, which Many may consider a disease of the past. We certainly don't see a lot of it in the United States, uh, but uh, it's not limited to the developing countries. Uh, there, many of you may be aware of a recent uh, outbreak in the United Kingdom of scarlet fever, so it's still out there. Um, and in fact, superficial group A strep infections occur each year, uh, several million of them occur each year in the United States according to the CDC. Of course, these aren't tracked, so this is just estimates by the CDC. Um, and if we narrow that down to uh, group A strep pharyngitis in particular, uh, it is the most common bacterial cause of pharyngitis in children, uh, accounting for 15 to 30 percent. Uh, it manifests in all ages, but its prevalence certainly peaks uh, between five and ten years of age and then drops to about five to 15% of cases in adult. There is definitely a seasonal enhancement of prevalence that's seen. And this is just sharing our own numbers here from Michigan Medicine, looking at our rapid antigen test positivity and volume. And you'll see that over these four years that I've put here on this graph, there's definitely seasonal enhancement that occurs right around the new year um, that can almost take our numbers from an average of about 600 tests per month all the way up to 1,800 
during peak season. <clears throat> Pardon me. So how about disease sequelae from those superficial infections? Uh, the main sequelae that I'd uh, like to discuss or mention this morning or this afternoon uh, is acute rheumatic fever, uh, rheumatic heart disease, and then also acute post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, both of which, all three of which account for uh, almost a half a million cases for ARF and glomerular nephritis in uh, 15 to 20 million cases of rheumatic heart disease worldwide. So this is worldwide. When we look at the incidence in the United States, it's, it's less. Um, although it is somewhat unknown as it's not reportable. And we'll talk about that a little more on the next slide. But as far as the incidence goes, uh, it's, it ranges in onset from ages of five to 30 years old and peaks in the ages of 10 to 14 years. And how does this sequelae develop? Uh, it's a multifactorial autoimmune response and this is a great diagram that I found in an article from Lancet in 2005 that really does a good job of describing this multifactorial response and the components of it, or at least how it's believed to develop. First off, you need a susceptible host, a genetically susceptible host, uh, and there's a certain predisposition to that. You need repeated group A strep exposure uh, with that primes the immune response and the number of those infections and exposures is definitely influenced by environmental factors, overcrowding uh, being one of the primary environmental factors. And you also then need infection with sequelae specific associated serotypes. Now there are 240 known serotypes, at least uh, group A strep, and at least eight of those are associated specifically with acute rheumatic fever. So there's definitely uh, three, at least three, uh, explicit factors that have to occur for you to develop this acute rheumatic fever. And then continuation of those repeated infections and uh, uh, recurrent ARF actually can then lead to uh, further sequelae such as rheumatic heart disease. And how about the epidemiology of uh, streptogenes ARF worldwide? Uh, some nice uh, incidence maps here showing that uh, it was quite prevalent during the 70s and 80s, even in Canada, uh, and most prevalent in China and India. Although you'll note that there's a lot of white on this map as it's not generally well tracked and very spotty reporting worldwide. You'll note in the United States, there's no rate listed for the United States in general. It's, it's not uh, reportable. And the indications that we have here are generally from uh, uh, incident reports of outbreaks. So this ARF prevalence, as was mentioned in the previous slide, is strongly associated with a low socioeconomic status of countries. Crowding, lack of accessible medical care, generally the developing world is very susceptible to this disease. Pockets of ARF do occur though in countries of higher socioeconomic status, such as those regional outbreaks uh, that were noted uh, in Tennessee, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Utah. And the overall prevalence in the U.S. is thought to be uh, less than one per 100,000. Wouldn't you know it? Don't get a call the entire day right during the presentation. My apologies. Um, multifactorial nature of the development of group A strep sequelae means that the risk for significant disease outbreaks still exists throughout the world. And if we look at how things have changed from the 70s and 80s, uh, into uh, the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, you'll see that the incidence has decreased in, say, is Canada, but in the 70s and 80s, there was nothing reported in Mexico, or at least not reported. It's highly unlikely there was no disease there, uh, but it's actually one of the highest reported countries now in the 90s and the early 2000s. So the disease is still out there. Its multifactorial nature means uh, it definitely has hot spots due to socioeconomic status, but it can spread and pop up anywhere. <clears throat> How about Streptococcus pyogenes invasive disease? Um, what's the link there maybe with pharyngitis? Well, the invasive disease is listed here, bacteremia, purpural sepsis, cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis, and strep streptococcal toxic shock syndrome also have a huge incidence worldwide. 
uh, although not as much in the United States. Uh, the CDC tracks invasive group A strep infections through its active bacterial core surveillance program, which is a population-based active and laboratory-based surveillance system. And they've tracked between 10 to 18,000 cases of invasive group A strep disease uh, each year uh, in the U.S., of which there were also 1,100 to 1,600 deaths due to invasive group A strep annually. Now that incidence of invasive disease has also been steadily increasing over the past two, to two decades. As you'll see here in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, the cases, number of cases were in the 10,000s uh, and have definitely started an increase in the uh, 20 teens. Now, getting back to the point of this talk, group A strep pharyngitis, you know, is there a link? Is there any potential link between invasive disease and group A strep pharyngitis? Well, there certainly is an overlap in the seasonality of invasive infection rates with pharyngitis. This study uh, from the Clinical Infectious Disease Journal from U.S. infection rates from 2005 to 2012 shows that the proportion of cases uh, over than more than doubles uh, seasonally, and these seasons do tend to overlap exactly with the same time that you see increases in rates of pharyngitis. Now, these years obviously are not the same that I'm displaying here, but I just have them listed side by side so you can see the parallel uh, seasonality at the same time frame of the year. There's also common EMM types associated with pharyngitis and invasive disease. Uh, the 25 most common EMM types uh, in the established market economies are listed here as well as the 25 most common EMM types contributing to pharyngeal disease are listed here. And interestingly enough, three of the four top uh, types involved with invasive disease uh, match up very nicely with three of the four top uh, EMM types associated with pharyngeal disease. EMM1 is number one and number two in pharyngeal. EMM28 is number two in invasive, comes in at number four in pharyngeal. So there's an interesting link there as well, I believe. So hopefully uh, I've spoken a little bit there to the relevance of the disease and in keeping tabs on it and really doing our best to diagnose it even in uh, part of the world where uh, group A strep disease is not as uh, prevalent as it is uh, in the developing countries, but there still is a risk to be had. Uh, so let's, to, let's look into the rightness then of the group A strep algorithm as it, as it exists. Um, there are diagnostic guidelines for the clinician that exist out there, and there was a nice comparison published in American Family Physician in 2016 that looked at those uh, pharyngitis guidelines for group A beta hemolytic strep, both in, are in the American College of Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Infectious Disease Society of America. And what you'll see is initially they all uh, recommend use of some sort of criteria or clinical criteria to assess a patient's risk for infection uh, and determine the next, the best path of testing or treatment. I will emphasize uh, the CENTAUR criteria here, as I'll be referring to it uh, later on in the talk as well, and how it is assigns points according to the absence of cough, swollen cervical nodes, high temperature, tonsil or exited swelling or swelling, and then the patient age as well, which correlates with the peak rates of group A strep pharyngitis. And according to that score that they get, they then direct the clinician whether to go ahead with empiric therapy of antibiotics with no testing, testing with those in the middle link scores, and then scores of zero or one, they would recommend no further testing or an option for testing with a score of one. Um, so that's what's recommended from the American College of Physicians. What's more interesting is that all three organizations also recommend that for children, you need a backup culture needed if that rapid antigen test result is negative. So why is that? Uh, well, we'll get to that in the next slide, but first off, I also wanna point out that the testing guidance for the lab, there's similar uh, guidance that exists from the College of American Pathologists who state explicitly in one of their standards in their checklist, their latest checklist, 
that group A streptococcus direct antigen testing is if it's performed on pediatric patients, confirmatory testing is performed on negative samples. And they also state further that policy should be established for the use of cultures or other confirmatory tests on these pediatric specimens that test negative. And that the policies that are established should take into account the sensitivity of that assay and use for the confirmatory test. So that leads us to the next poll question uh, for the audience. And we'd just like to know, uh, where does the initial group A strep take place in your facility? Is it being done in a core lab, uh, centralized testing uh, along uh, right away from the, from the physician? Is it done in a near patient testing location, uh, point of care? Is it a send out test? Or is your confirmatory test to send out uh, only and that you're uh, doing this initial test in-house? So I'll give it up to Candace again. Thank you, Dr. Leppard. As you mentioned, we do have a polling question launching now. Again, that question is, where does the initial group A strep test take place in your facility? Audience members, you can select from core lab or centralized testing, near patient testing or point of care, send out only or send out confirmation. Once more, that poll question reads, where does the initial group A strep test take place in your facility? And I'll leave a couple more moments for our audience members to vote. You can vote by selecting any one of those four options displayed on your screen. And it looks like a majority of our audience members here have voted. I'm going to close the poll now and share the results with all of you. It looks like 72% voted for core lab or centralized testing and 28% voted for near patient testing or point of care. Back to you, Dr. Leppert. Thank you, Candice. So why is that uh, recommendation so strong that these rapid antigen tests be confirmed by culture? Uh, well, that's answered really nicely in a recent Cochrane analysis of rapid antigen diagnostic tests for group A strep testing in children that compiled data from more than 100 rapid antigen test performance studies. And they came up with a summary sensitivity from all of those uh, studies of 85.6% sensitivity and specificity of 95.4% when that rapid antigen test is compared to culture. Uh, so basically that means that in a population of 1,000 children with a group A strep prevalence of 30%, which is not too far off of what we see uh, during peak prevalence season, you'd be missing 43 of those 300 positive patients. Uh, so not an insignificant number of false negatives. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatric also states that the accuracy of these tests is most dependent on the quality of the throat swab specimen which must contain pharyngeal and tonsillar secretions and is therefore dependent on the experience of the person performing the test in, in collecting a proper specimen. And the performance, another publication uh, from JCM in 2006, uh, very nicely showed how the performance of that rapid streptococcal antigen test, not just the collection of the specimen, but the performance of the test also varies by personnel uh, ranging from a sensitivity of that uh, study showing sensitivities ranging from 56 to 90% in both lab and non-lab personnel from different point of care and core lab sites. And this sensitivity drop off in concern is really uh, pointed out in the package inserts of many of these uh, rapid antigen tests. And I don't mean to pick on Sureview here at all. That's what we use in our system. It's an excellent test, um, but it does point out the important fact here that when you have a lot of strep present, either from excellent collection or just a patient that has a lot of uh, organism present in, this, in, their, uh, in their throat, uh, you'll get great performance of the test. It's when you get down to lower numbers of organism, either because of a poor collection or uh, just a very exquisitely sensitive patient to low numbers of organisms, you do get down to low, very low sensitivity uh, of numbers. So the question that uh, we next came to in our quest to reconfirm this algorithm 
is whether or not group A strep culture is still to be considered the gold standard as the confirmatory test for those rapid antigen tests. Um, there's not much fancy to a confirmatory group A strep culture. Uh, generally done on 5% sheep blood auger with tryptocase soy base. It's been considered the gold standard and generally held to be between 90 and 95% sensitive. Now there's, uh, there have definitely been published uh, other culture methods that may enhance upon that rate a little bit, uh, but that's generally the gold standard method uh, as listed. Growth is typically observed within uh, 24 hours of incubation. Although what we have found, and I think many of you have also experienced, is that when you get mixed cultures with very few numbers of group A strep, it can be difficult to definitively identify without a further subculture, potentially adding another overnight cycle or another 24 hours to the identification process. Uh, the other question that we asked was, you know, how, re how reliable are our traditional group A strep identification tools compared to PCR? There was an interesting little study that looked exactly at this in 2016 uh, that looked at 206 uh, beta hemolytic strep isolates that were tested for bacitracin sensitivity, PYR test, and Lansfield grouping. And of those 206 beta hemolytic strep, they found 175 that were PCR positive for strep biogenies, but only 160 of those exhibited all three of the traditionally expected test results for strep pyogenes. And that leads to this number here for all three of about 95% sensitivity for those particular assays in identifying the strep pyogenes. And what's also further interesting is 14 of those PCR negative beta hemolytic strep isolates demonstrated a positive result for one of those traditional test reactions that traditionally attributed to strep biogenies, and three of those demonstrated all three test reactions. Now, it's reasonable to argue that those three may be uh, actually negative, falsely negative PCRs, and that's certainly arguable. Uh, but I think the point being from this study and what we've seen in our, in our laboratory as well is that these bench side tests uh, are not perfect, uh, and they, they leave a little bit to be desired in terms of uh, accuracy sometimes. So let's look a little more closely at nucleic acid amplification for group A strep. Now there are literally dozens of studies out there on group A strep pharyngitis uh, or group A strep PCR or nucleic acid amplification techniques. It's nothing new. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. Uh, but this is a particular study I wanted to focus on today because I think they did a really good job of addressing the main concern that a lot of people have with molecular testing with group A strep is that in that, are we being too sensitive and potentially detecting carriage? Uh, so getting at their data, they found 71 uh, group A strep positive samples. 70 of the 71 were detected alone by the molecular assay. Uh, 35 of the 71 were detected alone by rapid testing and 55 detected by culture. So you're seeing a definite uh, improvement in the detection and sensitivity by the molecular assay. Uh, if you use the rapid antigen test with culture confirmation following, you do improve that sensitivity a little bit to 58 out of the 71. So getting at that point then, whether molecular testing and that distinction between carrier and true infection, well, I'll go back to what we were talking about in terms of the Centaur score and the phenoty uh, phenotypic uh, uh, relationship of the patient with the organism and the positivity we see with group A strep. And looking at their data here, you see that molecular testing identified 15 additional positives in this group with significant center scores of greater than or equal to two compared to culture and rapid positive. So we're definitely identifying positives in a group that has a very high suspicion of disease uh, symptomatically. But it also did identify seven additional positives with very low center scores of less than two, uh, which could be construed as being part of that carriage group. So as with most things, it's a little bit of good and a little bit of bad potentially. So we've also looked at uh, molecular test, testing of group A strep here at Michigan Medicine. We did so prior to my arrival here, a few years back in 2015, we looked at the Quidel Ampliview group A strep test and we looked at 100 
uh, consecutive isolates that were submitted to the lab for uh, culture confirmation of negative rapid tests. And what we found were that 72 of those were indeed negative by both molecular assay and by culture. We found that there were seven that were outright positive by culture that also confirmed as molecular positive. There were six that interestingly enough were initially culture negative, were amplify positive, and then when they went back and recultured those with the Monday morning quarterback eye, were able to find indeed group A streps in those cultures. Um, there were additionally then 15 uh, cultures that were negative and reproducibly negative, but still positive uh, by Ampliview as well. Now, with that study, uh, they did not look at any of uh, the patient data, but then uh, just recently in 2018, in the beginning of this year, uh, we brought in two uh, additional assays and looked at, again, another group of uh, negative confirmations that came into our lab and we tested them by the molecular assays as you see. So starting off on the right here, we looked at 68, uh, 68 of these uh, were of these culture or rapid antigen, sorry, rapid antigen negatives uh, were culture, were nat negative as well. Uh, 66 of those were nat negative as well, two of which uh, were rapid antigen positive, uh, but NAT negative. Now, those same two were NAT negative by the Simplexa assay. Uh, and what's interesting about those two specimens in particular is one of which was retest negative by the rapid antigen test, was culture negative, and was uh, NAT negative. So we can only assume that that may be an example of a misread rapid test at the point of care location. The second one was reported in the clinical literature or the clinical notes as uh, rapid positive. However, it came through our system as a rapid negative, was culture negative and PCR negative. So again, that may be another incident of a falsely positive rapid antigen test, not, but not because of the test itself, but because of the uh, misread perhaps. If we look at those that were NAP positive, uh, there are a group of those uh, that were culture positive and NAT positive, uh, which we would expect, and zero of those culture positives were NAT negative. But there was also a significant number that were culture negative that were also NAT positive. And those are those additional positives that we're concerned with. Are those indicating carriage or are those indicating true uh, clinically relevant positive cases? So this time we were able to go back and grab some of the clinical records of some of these patients and do a comparison similar to what they did in the Felsenstein paper, where we looked at their Centaur scores of the rapid positives, those that were culture positive, rapid negative, and those were the rapid negative, culture negative, and NAT positive. So this is that interesting group here. And what we found was that those with center scores greater than or equal to four fell into the category where there were a significant number of those that were rapid positive, as you would expect, some that were culture positive but rapid negative. And we also had a good number, three of our uh, seven that we looked at that had clinical records were also in this category of significant uh, symptomatic disease. In that two to three kind of middle score where you definitely are being recommended that you perform this test because the risk of disease is a little lower than you would have in a score of four. That's where the majority of our rapid positives fell that we looked at. Our culture positives were also in that category. And we caught a few more uh, NAT positive tests as well that were in that category. Uh, so that would be five out of the seven that seemed to be in a significant symptomatic category that we detected by NAT alone. And then of course, there are a couple that are showing up in this low score category uh, that are both culture positive only on that reflex of the rapid and also NAT positive only, two additional ones there. And the question that we asked ourselves here, is this really an issue of test performance? And should we limit the tests that we're using because of this behavior or is this uh, an opportunity for the lab to interact with the clinicians and reinforce the adherence to clinical test utilization and guidance in order to, uh, is the key really to ideal, ideal test performance. 
should these even have any testing done on them at all? So moving on then to the rapid aspect of the testing uh, and the speed that we're getting these results to clinicians, uh, I want to discuss a little bit the utility of PCR as a rapid antigen test confirmatory test for the outpatient population. I think it's undoubtable that we could say that PCR confirmation of these negatives will be faster than culture, but the question is, does that or how does that impact patient care? Uh, when we look at our outpatient needs here at Michigan Medicine, uh, the outpatient confirmatory specimens that we're handling are about 90% of our volume. That testing is done as a point of care test at the different facilities and clinics, and then the confirmatory testing is sent to us. Uh, generally at the end of the business day. Molecular testing would then allow for a confirmation of those negatives by the next morning. We have our setup so that the afternoon and evening shifts would be doing that testing uh, versus uh, the current practice, which is between one and two days then for that culture result to be uh, finaled. The impacts that we would expect to see is an improved clinician and patient satisfaction in getting that result that next day. Uh, the clinician being able to reach out to those patients that have that confirmat uh, confirmatory test positive and get that uh, script filled immediately the day after they saw the physician. And also antibiotic stewardship. I would argue uh, that this uh, recommendation that uh, those with a score of greater than or equal to four should consider empiric treatment uh, when the risk is a flip of a coin. Uh, with the diagnostics that we have right now, I would argue that you should still be testing those. And as you saw, there were a significant number of patients that we saw in our studies that were negative despite having a really high score. Uh, some emerging options I just wanted to briefly mention uh, in terms of outpatient care. There are waived point-of-care molecular uh, group A strep tests available, uh, although our concern uh, would be, uh, again, we've seen issues and there are published issues of trouble with point of care testings as they exist for uh, rapid tests. And if you put a molecular device into the point of care arena, uh, one can only imagine the problems that might develop there. Um, the other option is to bypass, bypass point of care testing altogether and send directly to the lab for PCR alone. Uh, again, expecting to get that result back the next morning. Uh, that could be uh, the way to go, a very accurate way to get a result and avoid the possible rapid antigen uh, false positives. How about in the ED and inpatient population? Uh, again, it's not a great number in our system. Only about 10% of our group A strep volume comes from the ED, uh, about 2% from the inpatient. And again, these are generally patients that aren't incredibly ill and they're uh, for better or for worse, using the ED is somewhat of an urgent care facility. Uh, so the rapid testing is done as a point of care test in the ED or on the patient floor and confirmatory testing is then sent to core hospital microbiology lab. So with the uh, implementation of our molecular tests, we're hoping potentially to bypass the point of care, the need for point of care testing altogether. So they can just send the test right to us in the core lab that molecular testing would then allow for confirmation of negatives or uh, a test result uh, without that point of care test within hours. Uh, we feel we have the ability to perform this as a stat test as needed because this volume is not very high uh, versus one to two days for culture. Uh, and again, what's the impact that we would think to see? We are hoping that uh, the impact of the ED would be allow to allow for a more accurate diagnosis and appropriate antibiotic therapy prior to discharge. Uh, it's all about bed management in the ED and getting patients in and out as quickly as possible with that accurate diagnostic, as well as um, appropriate therapy right away and our diagnosis right away. It's very hard to follow up on a lot of these ED patients after they're gone. And of course, there's the impact to the inpatient that you would expect to see. On one side of the coin, you hope to minimize the time spent on isolation and infection control precautions waiting for a confirmatory culture result. And on the other side of the coin, you want to minimize that time to detection and decrease potential invasive strep A complications in patients or spread of group A strep in a hospital setting. 
how about its impact to the lab? You know, that's definitely going to have an impact in our workflow. Uh, and there are potential in lab benefits to the PCR confirmation of these rapid negatives over culture. Uh, there's definitely an efficiency impact on our workflow. Our current state requires a screening of about 30 cultures per day and an additional workup of an expected average of one to three cultures per day that turn positive. And if you look at all the factors involved in the processing of those cultures, you have you come to about an hour for processing of 30 negative group A strep rapid antigen test swabs for culture, and about one to two minutes for culture negative and 10 minutes for the additional workup of one to three possible positives, leading to a hands-on time for the workup of these cultures of about one to two hours per day. Total time allotted then to group A strep culture, including processing and workup would be about two to three hours per day, utilizing a med tech and a lab tech generally. Now, if you look at the comparably what you would need to, re, uh, for, to run these as a nucleic acid amplification technique on the platform we've evaluated, uh, the time for setup of about 30 specimens is estimated to be about one minutes per specimen. So your total time is very simple at about 30 minutes for 30 specimens, not requiring any special processing uh, direct from sample to result. The other important aspect to uh, look at from a lab side is the importance of an objective result of a group A strep NAT versus that subjective group A strep culture workup. I think I would not be surprising anyone to say that we are in a, uh, a, a difficult time in the microbiology world uh, nationwide as uh, we're somewhat experiencing a brain drain of a lot of very experienced and valuable techs uh, get to that uh, age of retirement. And the new techs uh, that are coming in are, are bright and sharp, but they don't have that ability that our more experienced techs have to be able to see a group A strep from across the room and call it uh, as it is and be accurate. Um, now we have people coming in that it's, it's new to them and they're much more attuned to these molecular methods, uh, I think, uh, than the traditional methods. So that's an important consideration to make in your lab as well. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, straight up that group A strep pharyngitis and the related post-infectious sequelae should still be considered relevant to public health, even here in the developed world. Uh, as is its rapid and accurate diagnosis. That multifactorial nature of those development of sequelae bothers me and makes me worry that uh, this could be something that could come back to us anytime. I don't think our nature as a developed country has changed much from the 70s and 80s, so I highly doubt that's why we're not seeing as many outbreaks. Um, and I just wanted to bring it back again, full circle to the three R's of microbiology and when evaluating any assay, looking at its relevance and the clinical value in the test, the rightness or the accuracy of it is, is the test as accurate as it should or can be, and the rapidity of a test and uh, is the test result available to the clinicians promptly to allow for uh, ideal patient care. And I guess the other question that, I, that came to mind while preparing this talk is really why now you know what as i mentioned earlier group a strep pcr has been around for years so really what's changed in the paradigm to make it important to speak about this now and to make it important in our lab to bring this technology in house and really it's what i've found to be the fourth r and that's dollars um, and that's something that as a as a director and i think even as a uh, medtech supervisor manager anybody who's listening in this talk needs to take into account when providing patient care. And that is the cost of a method that you're bringing in. And what's changed now is that really it's capitalism. Uh, we have multiple FDA approved assays that are, are available now. Competition has lowered the cost. There's been cons consolidation of many NATs onto one platform. Uh, making incorporation of uh, different NAT assays more cost efficient and uh, cost effective and efficient. And there's an advent, uh, this new advent very recently of sample to answer NAT technologies that really can improve your tests per FDE metric 
versus culture and allow for 24 hour testing, stat testing support of your inpatient services and ED services. Uh, and as I said before, this is happening to all labs around the country right now, uh, where we're being asked to improve those numbers and those tests per FDE metric, and we're losing techs that are worth to uh, techs uh, with the amount of work and the experience that they have. Uh, and I'd like to then finish off with a slide here, uh, just illustrating that point of how many group A strep NAD assays do exist now. Uh, this is a, I hope to be a comprehensive list that I was able to find and put together of the FDA approved group A strep NAD assays that exist. It's in alphabetical order by uh, manufacturer. And you can also find a similar list on the website that I've listed down here below at FDA.gov. And with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, for our final uh, poll question. Uh, how is your facility utilizing group A strep molecular testing today? Uh, are they using molecular testing only? Is molecular test being used as a confirmatory test to a negative EIA? Or is there no molecular solution being used in your lab today? And I'll turn it over to Candace. Thank you very much, Dr. Lepart. Audience members, once more, here is our final poll question for the webinar. That poll question reads, how are you utilizing group A strep molecular testing today? Audience members, you can select from molecular only, molecular is a confirmatory test to a negative EIA test, or no molecular solution today. Once more, that poll question reads, how are you utilizing group A strep molecular testing today? And it looks like a majority of our audience members have voted here. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and share the answers with you all. It looks like 70% voted for no molecular solution today, 17% voted for molecular only, and 13% voted for molecular is the confirmatory test to a negative EIA test. Back to you, Dr. Lepart. Thank you, Candice. And May I say uh, a big thank you to the audience today. Uh, talk about your rapid response to the poll questions, by the way. That was fantastic. I was uh, shocked at how quickly we got response to those. I was expecting to sit around for a minute, and most of the talks I've been to where polls have been included, uh, it takes quite a while to get a participation. So thank you, everybody out there, for your participation. And I'll just finish off my talk today with uh, listing of a lot of the references that I included in this or used in the preparation of this talk, uh, most of which were included next to the uh, references as I talked about them. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you again. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lepart. That concludes our uh, presentation portion of our webinar here. Audience members, we now welcome you to continue sending your questions and comments right now using the questions window for the question and answer portion of this webinar. I've already received some questions, so I'll start with those. First question here is, what about strep group C and group G? Do you think it is important to detect those types of strep? Great question. Um, and I somewhat, I, I have to admit, I purposely kind of let that out because I knew that question was coming. Um, and in our, in my opinion, uh, they're definitely important. They're definitely been shown to play a role in bacterial pharyngitis. Um, I think the real reason that we would not include those in our paradigm uh, of testing here is that I don't think they've been shown to play a significant role in that development of sequelae, which is really the important uh, driver to really have a very highly accurate diagnostic for group A strep. That being said, uh, I know there are uh, molecular platforms out there now that offer testing of both group A, C, and G, and that might be the perfect option uh, for your lab if uh, you have a high prevalence of those pathogens in your uh, population. And I would think that that might be something we would look into in the next couple of years and actually doing a more comprehensive study of our uh, patients that are negative rapid tests, even including positives sometimes, to see if uh, there's any po uh, significant population of group C or G in our patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Lepart. 
Our next question here is, if you are performing rapid diagnostic test first, are you collecting two swabs? Uh, no, actually we're not. And the way that we do it in our institution is we're using uh, a type of transport, an e-swab transport device so that that initial throat swab is collected and, and placed into the transport. Uh, and then the point of care uh, test is being done on that. And the residual uh, specimen is then sent along to the core lab for confirmatory testing of negatives. So we're uh, hopefully avoiding any potential bias there of going for the second swab and maybe missing out on all the, uh, the, the high, uh, high value uh, substance found in that first swab. Thank you very much for that answer there. Our next question here is, how does the expedited molecular workflow impact the lab during the height of strep season? Yeah, so this is all hypothetical, obviously, as we haven't uh, implemented it fully here yet uh, and haven't, haven't had it implemented during a peak strep season. But as you saw from those seasonal data that I presented, our volumes uh, were more than twofold higher, uh, two to threefold higher when we get to that peak season. And that's a stressor on our staff in both uh, reading and processing all of those uh, negative strep uh, specimens that are coming in for a culture confirmation. Uh, kind of alluding to those numbers again, uh, those rough numbers that we put together in terms of the workflow and the time required, uh, it would be much faster and should be much faster for us to process uh, those molecularly in a sample to answer format than to uh, process and read and work up those cultures manually. So we're looking forward to having more data on that in the coming uh, year. Thank you very much for that answer. Our next question here is, what data supports not backing up rapid antigen negative test with culture in adults? Yeah, you know, I don't know that there is a whole lot of data uh, in that sense. I think there is probably importance to back up uh, negative rapid antigen tests in adults. It's just not uh, really indicated by any of the guidelines that exist out there. Um, there's certainly studies that have been produced that show that there's a value in, uh, in the economic impact uh, that uh, is had if the, uh, with missed group A strep infections in adults uh, with a falsely negative rapid antigen test. Uh, again, I think the prime reason that their focus is on the pediatric population is that potential for development of sequelae and to limit that. By the time you're in your adult ages, um, that potential for development of sequelae has reduced significantly as the incidence numbers have shown uh, epidemiologically. So again, the impact potentially of a missed group A strep infection in an adult uh, doesn't carry with it that, uh, that sequelae driven uh, concern. Thank you very much for that answer there. Our next question here is, how did you make the decision to move to group A molecular testing and what were some of the technological parameters that drove your decision? So we, uh, we recently moved into a new lab here at Michigan Medicine and implemented some new techniques on the bacteriologic side uh, by implementing the Keystra system. And one of the key tenets of that system is to simplify and standardize. And so we began looking at a lot of our processes and where we could simplify and standardize the workflow uh, and also at the same time uh, get a better and more accurate result. And so this was one of our prime targets. It certainly, uh, we had the platform already or we had a platform already that would allow uh, for us to add this onto its menu. And we also evaluated some other platforms that we knew had uh, additional tests that we were interested in adding onto them to sort of consolidate around the group A strep. So uh, that idea of consolidation, simplification, and standardization really is what drove uh, 
the uh, implementation then of this group A strep assay, molecular assay in our lab. Thank you very much, Dr. Leppard, for those answers. We've reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you have any further questions, please direct them to the contact information showing on your screen. Thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speaker, Dr. Paul Leppert, and feel free to share this webinar with your colleagues by clicking the link in the chat box. We hope you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.